Hi, I'm Josh After, founder of Manhattan Edit Workshop. I would like to welcome you to the next edition of Sight, Sound, and Story. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Emmy-winning supervised sound editor Matt Skelding and sound designers Luke Gentry and Ben Meekin about creating the sound of Amazon's new fantasy series, The Wheel of Time. Um, this is going to be a super interesting look at how they created a completely new sound identity for an unknown world, creatures, and soundscapes based only from the popular book series. So I want to thank you for supporting our event series. I always do. And since we've shifted online, it's been an amazing adventure. We're still looking forward to coming back and doing more in person. We will be doing that hopefully soon. I want to thank our sponsors, OWC, AJA, American Cinema Editors, Zeiss, and Filmmaker U, without whom none of this would be possible. And finally, I'd like to thank the folks behind making tonight's event, Mike Malinsky, Stephanie and Philippe, and everyone at Lumos PR, and Janet Dalton, and of course, Jason Banky from Manhattan Edit Workshop, the Oz behind the curtain. Um, as always, I say with online events, uh, tech issues can happen, but we'll do our best to ensure that things run smoothly and adjust to work it out as soon as possible. So please be patient if we encounter any hiccups. I'd like to uh, hand over the mic to Woody Woodhall, CAS, who's an award-winning supervising sound editor, sound designer, and re-recording mixer, as well as co-founder of LAPPG. Have a great show, everybody, and see you soon. Thank you, Josh. I'd like to introduce our panel today. We have the team from Sona Sound Collective. Uh, we have supervising sound editor, Matt Skelding. We have sound designer, Ben Meekin, and sound designer, Luke Gentry. Um, these guys, uh, did I get that wrong? No. <laughs> no, you nailed it. First time. <laughs> Woo! All right, that's it. We're done. Thank you, guys. Um, we're going to talk about... These guys have done so much great work over the years. I'm sure you've heard and uh, a lot of the work um, over the years. But uh, today we're going to talk about The Wheel of Time uh, and really take a deep dive into their sound work on that series for Amazon. So thank you all for coming today, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank Great. you. And um, let's sort of go back for a second. And had any of you read the books prior to um, working on the show? No, I, I hadn't at all. No, I don't think. I, do you? I, no, I, embarrassingly, I hadn't even heard of the book series. Yeah. To be honest, it was when it was introduced to me. It was a bit of a shock that it existed. Yeah, as a, like, I mean, it, it's such a popular book series. It, um, over in the UK, it wasn't. I think it, it, it was bigger in the US than it ha was over here. I think so. I think we've been so dominated by Lord of the Rings for the years mm. that it's kind of been a right. you know, so. Right. But it was, but when we when we like Matt first discussed it that it was a job. I mean, it, it, it was a bit of a no brainer to go for because from a sound point of view it was definitely something that we wanted to be involved in you know I mean the whole topic and the fantasy side of some is, is you know something we, do, we we like to get stuck into so it was uh, and we yeah. went out and bought the books then yeah when, when Matt said are you keen we obviously yeah. bought the books that's what we did yeah um, and, and then since it coming up obviously you meet so many people who have read the book series uh, yeah, and yeah. have very strong opinions about how it should be made and all that sort of stuff yeah. because it's so popular and, yeah. And, but, yeah. yeah that was the one thing we did find on the journey is that how popular it is and how the fans the books how much the, the books mean to them and from our point of view how how we had to try and get it right in certain areas yeah there's a lot of pressure there for sure um, did you so yeah uh, did they sort of inform you uh, the books themselves inform you into the soundscapes yeah definitely, definitely yeah. yeah i think we read the books and i had the audio book as well so i was listening to it at night mm. just trying to absorb mm. stuff um, and putting notes in and markers in, but also Amazon had um, that the, that wonderful lady who built us a Bible who knows it is Sarah. Like that, Sarah. Yeah. 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 So they had a researcher who was the sort of the by like created this big whole Bible for us, but yeah. she worked with the writers in the writers' room, and so she was our fountain of knowledge if we mm. ever needed to know anything about certain areas. So we'd speak to Sarah about, can you tell us about? The two rivers, for instance, and she mm. she come up with a list of all the foods and what the trades that they may do there, and so, some of the names yeah. of the characters that maybe yeah. are in that town. And we know they exist in that town, but on our principal sort of uh, story points, and then that informed obviously my side on the dialogues, but also the sound yeah. design as well. Yeah, just, for sure. Just just trying to find out what the environments were like, and you know, just just how we how we could kind of first approach stuff as a base layer, and then develop sounds 
from there really you know and just kind of find out what characters the people that lived in those towns and that thing so there was there was a there's a lot of information out there not only in the books the the wikipedia pages that are yeah. done, there's a companion but you know so we we were researching all the time because we were so conscious of how how much this, this series means to people so definitely you know, so it was uh that was quite that was quite fun because we do a lot of research but sometimes we can just get carried away with developing and making sounds and throw ourselves into it but we we always had to kind of just go hang on a minute you know what should this actually sound like this this particular well it must area. have been so exciting i mean you had this entire world that you had to build sonically you had these creatures that you had to build you had all these light weave elements and fantastical kind of sound design stuff so it must have been like really exciting when you started to look at it and go wow we're going to build this thing so working with i imagine you worked uh, a lot with the showrunner in terms of start getting those initial sounds going yeah rafe uh we had initial conversations with rafe whilst they were still shooting we hadn't even really seen any sort of um assemblies at that point and started talking about how the Trollocs, the Fade, and the Channeling, they were our three main sort of points to yeah. which we initially started working on. And just discussing those yeah. as ideas, and then Ben and Luke would come up with ideas. I, you might have even done your first passes not to picture, did you? I, I think so, yeah. yeah. It, it was a case of just, they, it, because those sounds were always going to be the things, no pun in, but woven through the whole series, it was we needed to get those right. And I think they were always going to be a basis for throughout the series. So Rafe and uh, producers and that came to us and we started developing ideas to early shoots and just penning stuff and sending it for the cutting room really so yeah exactly right. i think there's there's a you know early days in the show uh, there's no visual effects maybe there's a couple of blank cards or maybe there's yeah. a pretty dodgy lucky drawing so it sort of falls to us to try and come up with stuff that maybe could influence what it looks like um and also help tell that story early on and uh, we took some of those core ideas and developed them further and some things got thrown away and redeveloped completely but um, yeah it was uh, it was we were on pretty early getting ideas right when they were still shooting yeah. so yeah that was some stuff really stuck like yeah. the fade um, exactly, the fade was a pretty much a one pass I mean Ben yeah. did a lot of versions but the yeah. pass that is Rain in the flight. final film is is essentially one of those initial yeah. passes yeah it was early we we sent the versions over and Rafe just likes you know he was like that's it that's the one that's the that's one, that's one market <laughs> okay moving on <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it, I think it also helps in a weird way us not knowing the story that they're like off by heart because it allowed us to kind of be a bit more experimental with with sounds because I think just being really strict to the story can sometimes kind of be quite frustrating and that but it just allowed us to be a bit more have a bit more fun I mean not a bit more fun but have fun with it you know so. it has to be a jumping off point doesn't it yeah. the books have to be a where you then because Rafe has very strong ideas about how it should sound and look yeah. like the fade was done we had no visual effects at that point we yeah. couldn't see anything it had no teeth it was just a sort of a, a head uh, yeah. Per, yeah head yeah. <laughs> but hood. Rafe was very could describe it exactly how he wanted it and we yeah. could do it so everyone has very strong ideas uh, on the creative team very early on and it was our job to sort of replicate that and then take that further really. yeah. yeah it was nice the fact that he was he, he, he did like it as well because that gives you then a bit of a buzz and you kind of think right you're on a bit of a creative role here so it being allowed that freedom was definitely good for the the, the three of us and then when we started to get early scenes put together to come in to work to it we were just like this is great this is fun you know we're actually really fun things to do we can be really expressive and and, and you know throw ideas and they're going to tell us whether they like them or not at this stage rather than at the 15th hour when we're all standing. right everybody on the mix stage going you know what these trollocs just don't work <laughs> yeah <laughs> everything's getting muted and you're going to like yeah. libraries and stuff that everyone's used and you're yeah, like oh right why right we right yeah that's it yeah uh, so, um, you know, it, it must have been a daunting task. You know, it, it's changed so much nowadays where we have to deliver an entire series, essentially. I mean, we used to do episode by episode or there used to be a timing kind of thing. And now there's just this pressure of we're putting the whole thing out all at once. And so, um, you know, when we're used to doing a feature, you know, we've got 100 minutes, something like that. Here you've got eight hours. <laughs> that you've got to tackle. So how did you sort of parse all of that out? I mean, I know it, it's not dependent on you. It's dependent on 
production and editing and all the uh, picture editing and so on. But could you just sort of talk about that process a little bit? I think schedule wise, it worked quite well for us, weirdly, because of the COVID pan, the pandemic and the lockdown. It meant that their schedule extended a bit because the last two episodes weren't shot before they had to shut down the shoot and they had to come back. So it meant that for, as a team, we actually slimmed down to just basically a core team of us three and Adele, who was our dialogue editor, mm -hmm. so that we could basically hit each episode linearly. So we'd spend mm -hmm. our set period of time on Ep 1, we'd get it to the state we could do, as good as we could with the visual effects that we had, and we'd move on to two. So we managed to have a, a pass all the way through the first six episodes before we went into the mix on, yeah. on, the, on the first six. So oh, we'd wow. like... I guess I think the original schedule was that we'd have a huge team and everything would be happening at once. But mm -hmm. it basically meant that the four of us could be over all six episodes, all six hours yeah. simultaneously and just work our way through them. And then obviously we'd jump back ready for pre-mix and, um, mm, and yeah. the VFX would come in and then the same would happen. And then we'd do that same process for the final mix. We'd sort of pre-mix it, we'd get it to a certain point with the pre-mix, yeah. work through all the way to the end of episode six, and then the VFX updates would come in and we'd start back on the final mix. Mm. Seven and eight were a completely different matter because <laughs> that was absolute carnage because they shot them really late and had to turn them around very quickly. So on seven and eight, it was a completely different process. We had yeah. a team of like, I don't know, another four or five people and, and everything sleep. happened. Yeah, and everything <laughs> happened very quickly and the mixes of those were happening whilst we were in the mix on the other ones and yeah. Yeah. you know uh, it is a different yeah. But it was all what was quite nice as well about that is that collaboration. We were able to then get the episodes into a state to send to editorial who could then sit there. So Chris Barwell, the editor and the other editors, but then they were hearing stuff again and getting and getting used to the sounds that we were laying, getting used to Matt's, you know, dialogue that was going in, they were hearing stuff, ADR going in. So when we got to the mix stage, though there were new visual effects to go in, the sounds that they were there, they liked, they were used to. So we could spend the time creative mixing really making it shaping and kind of getting in and, and there was a lot of material because they're busy each one is like a mini movie you know they're busy episodes yes. and we track and we we come from different different we've done tv and film but generally you know we 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 track like like film so we're quite dynamic lots of sounds in there you know within yeah. lots of bosses and um so there was a lot of, for doug and Matt, because of the COVID restrictions, those were the two guys on the stage to kind of dig in and get through. And we were kind of, you know, lots of Zooms and calls and texts, WhatsApp, whatever, media pigeons, you know, whatever, just saying, yeah, push that, do that. We need yeah. that, you know. So it was. I think that bought us more time, really. Yeah. Because historically, we would have all been on the, on the stage and sort of doing that final build and polish together, but that wasn't physically possible possible because mm. of the COVID rule. So we were sat back here sort of like, well, we've got some time to do stuff and we needed that time to, to really get seven and eight to sing and sound as good as all the other reps. Mm. Uh, yeah. um, yeah. I think, um, but as you say, with these modern series now, there is that scary point where all eight episodes are in play, all eight episodes are unlocked, all eight episodes have sound that still needs track laying. And mm. it's a... It's a different thing, and it, it didn't used to exist, and it's quite a stressful point in the process. Yeah. And, yeah. and w what I tell my editors is that the start date always pushes, but the deliver date always comes sooner. So we're always squeezed because we're at the we're the end of the thing. We're you know have you locked, <laughs> you know? So we're 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 running uphill, you know, all the way through the stage. Um, I did want to mention, by the way, I know now you guys didn't mix it, right? Because the mix is also, besides all of your stellar work, the mix is really, really nice. Great, yeah, thank you. That really was Doug Cooper at uh, Warner Brothers at Delaney Lee. Um, we've worked with him before. He's he's a top mixer. He's done a lot of amazing stuff, and he yeah he brought his A game on that one for sure. Um, yeah, the dynamic. You know, shows like this can be overwhelming in terms of the sound, and I think the way that you guys design the sound. Uh, you made space for things. Um, but it also says something to me about the showrunner because the showrunner built space so that you guys could have those dynamics, right? Uh, I want to go to that first scene because, uh, oh, oh, no, actually, it's, it's, the, it's the third episode that has the real dynamics that I love. But let's start at episode two. This is when the fade arrives uh, and the uh, Terran ferry is destroyed. Have I not made myself clear? You're not the type of woman that hears no often. I am not. 
Come, quickly now. Servants of the Dark, the Riders of Fade. A Fade can force a Trolloc to do most things, but they won't cross that river. Come, we'll take you safely to the next town. What? No, no! My family! There's no going back now, Master. My son is on his way already. He'll be there in a moment. You have to help me. We can't leave him. If you go back, you'll give them a way to follow us. I can't allow it. <laughs> Right? You are to die, you monster! Stop! Don't! Great stuff. So many dynamics in there and just for people who don't do sound or no sound and understand the amount of work. I mean, I love the fact where we, you, they, we finally push into the fade and all you hear is the torch, right? You just hear the wind on the torch. It's just, you know, cause we're waiting, right? And then it's wow, fantastic. So let's talk about some of the detail of, uh, of making a scene like that happen. Well, it's got everything in it, that one, hasn't it? So you've got the Trollocs, the Fades, the, um, you know, we've got magic Physical and everything. Effects. It's, it's uh, just so many layers, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like, uh, we, even down to the backgrounds, like we, we start start with the backgrounds first, usually, then sort of set that scene. And I think sure. it was really important to us to sort of sell this place as sounding really ominous anyway. Mm. So there's like pitched bugs and frogs and stuff. So even before things have kicked off, it's just weird. So you're like, something's not quite right. Mm. Um, and then beyond that, you're just building and building and building. From a Trolloc point of view, it was a lot of um, lots of layers, lots of trying to get a sound of mass grunty, like piggy things. And there was a lot of like skin slaps and shield hits. And it's just so many different layers that build up that. And the hooves on the on the wood, yes. and it's just okay. all building and building and building and building. And, and then you've got those elements in the mix to sort of come in and out. Um, 
So yeah, lots going on. And then there's obviously Matt's bit, dialogue and treatments yeah. and... I think um, the really interesting thing about that sequence is obviously it's, it's quite constructed, isn't it? Because mm. all the, the Trollocs didn't exist when they shot it, really, yeah. most of them. Yeah. Uh, the destroying of the boat didn't exist. Yeah. So it's a sequence that we actually worked on quite early One on. One of the and, first sequences, actually. Mm. Yeah. And sent material out, out to the cutting room. And there's a fair bit of ADR that we had to sort of like just... Like it just obviously when these things through no fault of anyone's these things mm. just need to be constructed together. So we would do we shot a lot of temp ADR to help them with the cut mm. in there. And um, Chris Barwell, who is the lead picture editor, is very instrumental in a lot of that process. He cut episodes one and two, and he was mm. the lead picture editor over the entire series. Mm. Um, so he was involved with that, and we'd sort of sent him little bounces ideas, and he'd send stuff back, and we'd sort of a lot of back and forwards there. Mm. But like it, all the sound is constructed, isn't it? Like getting that dynamic. The guys have got an amazing dynamic on the Trollocs, where the Trollocs stop talking, yeah. mm. and the Trollocs obviously don't, for in this inst don't really have a language. So getting that sort of shape on grunts yeah, is it's... really quite difficult, I think. And like, <laughs> don't quite know how they did it, but you you get a sense that they're really waiting for the fade to make a noise, and that's a completely constructed thing, both visually and sort of sound wise. It was. Yeah. It's creating those moments, isn't it? It's just kind of yeah, just allowing. To silence to fill the tension and just allowing like these little moments that rather than the the loud things being the thing the, the, the things that get people it's creating that moment before that just makes everyone feel a bit uneasy yeah. um, and, and and we there is a lot of material in there we kind of like everything's got to have a sound we start there and then of course when you get to the mix stage it's like right the music's in what's going to survive now well we know we need to hit that that particular bit where they're running onto the the, the wooden bridge and we need to hit that bit so so it's a bit of a kind of comic book mix really you kind of got to pull stuff away and kind of hear what what we think's important so in, in, in a, of everything there is all made designed made we sit down we think about it we work on everything it was all we were quite proud that a lot of everything we we kind of had a go at making even the atmospheres you know we'd take stuff and we'd twist it and, and manipulate it just to feel like you know that it was original and different yeah and you're right that um uh rafe the showrunner very much led that yeah. process he's yeah, very much you? we were from the very first conversation we had it was all about creating this world and, and like you say is we have these core sounds that were the main focus of ben and luke but yeah. everything else is a world that has been created and mm. you want to believe that they're living and, and existing in yeah. this world and mm. yeah. And that all came from Rafe, as from the initial conversation. Really. Yeah, he's really passionate about it, which was great, and that translated to us, I think. So I think also to add, uh, we can only do great sound work when there's great picture as well. And and you spoke before about the fact that there are those natural beats in there where we get to tell these small stories and then back away and then tell that story and back away and always handing over to different departments and different sort of moments just to, to, to sort of push that narrative and mm. it's there visually for us so like half our job is done we just need mm -hmm. to turn up and and show up and yeah. do our do our do our best and, and it sounds like that so yeah. yeah we're grateful to that for sure half the trollocs were there and then they appeared a lot more yeah they? there's always that one <laughs> <laughs> they turn up later so. well those guys at craft services are just a nightmare but uh uh the score too is really great and i love all the vocal because you don't really hear that in shows. You don't hear uh, singing, and, uh, and here there's languages, song, and uh, really, really nice. He used a lot of the old, I think he used the old, some, tongue, the old yeah. tongue from the books, actually. I think there's a lot of that in there. So that I know Lorne was kind of very, he, he wanted to use that and use that, you know, so people could go and nod to it. Yeah, and I think there's also, we were, it was very clear to us early on that we need to tell this story of like, light and shade and male and female and sort of and that was something that we played with a lot and it seems like something that Lorne played with a lot as well you get these these moments where it's female vocals then it switches to male vocals and it's so subtle but it's so clever just to help sort of subtly move you depending on what's happening on the screen and mm. um, you know he's amazing at that he's yeah, so that's his thing it's great and it, the score is amazing and he, it was really widely stemmed as well so Rod Burling, the music editor, really worked with us there. Because mm. you need to, like you say, and we've said, like creating those moments and the score really allowed us to do that. We could back off yeah. on certain elements at certain times just yes. to give us space and then, and then we could hand over to the score and the score could go fuller and we could back out of the way. It was Lawn's very open to that sort of idea. So we had every stem available you could possibly imagine. And 
mm. it gave us a chance in the mix to really work with it and sort of um, create something that, yeah, yeah lo lot balanced. Of a lot of tracks from all departments. <laughs> Poor old Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, shows like this, uh, the the streaming services now, there's just so much money. Like, th this is something that would be a blockbuster feature film 15 years ago, right? I mean, this would be, and, and it is, except we're just, we're watching it at home on our stereo. You know, I was, I was lucky enough, I, I listened to it in um, 5.1 and I listened to it in stereo. And um, it sounds beautiful in both. Uh, in stereo, the, the particularly for the voices, the mixing of the voices is really beautifully done. It's really nicely panned. All um, it, I'm assuming it's an Atmos mix. It's an Atmos native mix. Yeah, Doug is um, Doug. Uh, what he did, Children of Men. You know that Alfonso Cuarón mm. film. So he's uh, he's very much into that creating moving stuff around. That mm. film was like amazing for that, wasn't mm. it? So. Um, yeah, he's very into that. There's, there's lots of dialogue panic. <laughs> yeah, we try. Yeah, he's, he, he'd pan everything if we let him. So it's kind of like you know. So it's like you know. Sometimes you got to kind of go. Hang on, Doug. They're walking off over there, but the voice is still coming over here. So, but we we have a great relationship. We've all worked with each other for a long time. You know, um, we we've known Doug, and and that that really helped us in the process because we were able to kind of get him in and play him stuff and and kind of get his opinion on things and know that when he sent us a premix we could kind of have and say hang on this is how we meant this to be actually you've kind of come from that angle or kind of gone okay great you're taking it there you know or or just have generally have fun with all this chat like the bit where she's channeling on the boat and the water we like look that needs to just feel as cool as possible so even though we're seeing it on screen, just throw it around the room and that kind of stuff. So he, he's open to that. Yeah, he had a lot of fun with the objects in the yeah, sort of sequences yeah. in the yeah. Atmos. And, yeah, the yeah, Dolby. Well, it's, I was I was hoping to hear it in in Atmos. So maybe one day we'll get we'll get to see it at a theater. I don't have access to a stage readily available to me. So <laughs> hey man, I just want to check out a couple episodes of the show. And, uh, but uh, great work. Well, let's go to the uh, next episode, which is uh, episode three. By the way, for those of you who haven't read the books and haven't seen the show, yes, there will be spoilers, so just so you know. Um, probably already blown a few things. Uh, this is the uh, scene with Nynaeve uh, and the Trolloc fight.
All in a day's work. Wow. <laughs> I um, wish it was a day's work. <laughs> Do you know what? I, <laughs> yeah, I think these boys wish it was a day's work as well. I, I'm sure. Well, let, let's break a few things down there because there's a lot going on. First of all, uh, for you, Matt, uh, how much of that was replaced? Was that uh, her ADR breathing and exertions and all that stuff? Or was that location or a mix? Um, it's predominantly ADR, but there's we always try and use as much as we can from the production and there's actually a huge amount of production in the series as a whole but in that sequence obviously there's so much uh you know when she's running towards us the camera's on a van yeah. and all that yeah. sort of stuff so that's not usable but yeah i mean she was amazing it's always amazing at adr and i think it really anchors everything that's going on around her and yeah, it, it, it keeps the audience really <coughs> locked in on her mm -hmm. and her sort of struggle so it was amazing, and it was uh, it wouldn't have worked if we hadn't have got such an amazing performance of Zoe. Yeah. Um, so it is predominant in the ADR in that sequence. So and and the vocalizations for the Trolloc now uh, is that a team effort or was did one one of you take that on and? Yeah. So it's overall across the show it was a, it was a team effort, um, but that part there was yeah, yeah. I think it was mainly me that yeah, bit. Yeah, predominantly you. Yeah. Um, he was on that for three and a half years. Uh, honestly, <laughs> we did the rest of the film. I, I basically just did that um, to the point where the, they, they would come in and they'd be like, are you still doing this Trolloc? And I'm like, it can be better. It needs to yeah. be better. We can get it. It's more emotive. We need to tell the story better. We can do better. We can be more original and on and on and on it went to the point where I basically got told to stop and yeah. moved on to something else and came back with some fresh ears. So yeah, I... Lost a lot of sleep over that yeah. section, but... But it shows, though, right? I yeah, mean, it's I think... Oh, yes. <clears throat> well, talk about what elements, <clears throat> excuse me, are in there. So there's heaps and heaps and heaps of st stuff, but uh, generally um, the main man, if you will, the main sort of leader, he, he's like, he has these baboon grunts, the big whoo at the start. He's the only one that does those because I wanted him to sound different to everybody else, and it happens a couple of times in the show, but it, it clearly happens there. He was bigger, he filled the space more, he set the verbs off more, uh, and he lived in a bigger, beefier register, and then all the dying Trolloc stuff was, it was a lot of, um, like, uh, dolphins and sort of, like, screechy, slurpy, blowholey stuff just to try and make it feel thin and very different to the, to the guy that was okay, and obviously we needed to, it to feel panicked, um, and that's when the sort of layer of Daxophone came in, which mm. was um, loads and loads and loads and loads of layers, basically. And eventually we thought to ourselves, we need something new here and original here and something a bit different. And a good mate of ours, Rowan, who's also a sound designer, I was chatting to him about it. And he was like, oh, have you heard of this thing called a Daxophone? Which I hadn't. And it's, it's basically like a, the same principle as bowing a ruler. Uh, you know, when you hit a ruler in the school desk and you went, Brrrp. it's that, but it's bowed and it does these animalistic Crazy, yeah. creature screams basically um so we we did we basically built one which was terrible um, and we tried to bow everything we were bowing rulers and we were yeah. bowing bits of metal and getting some good results but eventually we went down the daxophone route and this little subculture of people that make them and love them and i found a guy who makes them and who's a bit of a avid player called daniel fishkin um reached out to him said look I need a palette, a sound, a, 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 a library of screams and creatures. I can't really tell you what they look like. I can't really tell you about the show because I'm tied up in NDAs. And, and he was really cool and um, made me this amazing grab bag of stuff. And that's the, that's, that's the stuff that's going in there to create like the screechy high-end death stuff. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, he really came through and I think that's what makes him sound original. And because it's organic and it's an instrument, it still lives in the real world. It's not too alien, it's not too synthetic. Um, so I think overall we got there, but it was do a bit, put it down, do a bit more, put it down. They change the picture a bit, we come back. Um, and then we try and tell, tell different stories sometimes and it really did evolve and evolve and evolve and I lost a lot of sleep but, but yeah. there we go, we got there in the end. Because <laughs> we, we, we came up quite against, obviously the parameters with television are very different to, 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 to film. So kind of dynamically, you know, we're sat in our rooms and we've got the, 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 the Trollocs coming out of all speakers and they sound amazing and then you get them in, in the room, you play them back through 
you know, TV stereo, and we're kind of like, what's not hitting, you know? And that was what was frustrating, I think, for Luke. He was just like, they're just not getting me, they're not hitting me. So, and I think that that instrument, the saxophone, gave that little that just bit of edge. And we're just like, okay, on the close ups, you just feel it as that little element, as well as all the other animalistic sounds and that he's got in there. But it was, um, it was a good find. I think was, a lot of the breathing from the trollop yeah. really helps us as well. The yeah. stuff that links yeah. without that, and the if the roars just dis disconnected sort of traditional monster stuff, yeah. like yeah. we've all done it yeah. on other monsters, you need that stuff to link it all. And mm. the difficult thing for this one, obviously, is it's this that fairly rudimentary level of communication that the two Trollocs have, yeah. telling that story within the sort of 15 seconds Gross. or 10 seconds you have <laughs> yeah. before the Trolloc dies is a really difficult thing because yeah, we haven't yeah. come across that before in the story. So I think that was the difficult thing to sell. Yeah. Creating a language yeah. without a language, really. Yeah, I think you're right about that. It would just be a floating voice if it wasn't for all those other bits that turn up. And yeah. I think Foley made a, played yeah. a massive yeah. part in this. Yeah. Barney, who does our Foley... He's amazing what he does, yeah. um, and he brought you know he brought his A game, and it's it just it's that glue. It brings it all together, and especially we talked about how important her voices were to sell panic and to stay with her. But you need those stomping feet and the twig snaps as she's scrambling yeah. around, and that reality just that's what gets the hair standing up on the back of your neck. Like, the dragging, the splashing, even yeah, when she yeah. when you hear her clank the knife down as she comes out of the you know just little that that's the thing that i'm really impressed with with your work on this show there's just so many little details i mean i i, I know if you're not a sound person like me you may not be you know catch that you i mean you catch it as an audience of course but i know i know what went behind the work that you guys did and understand the amount of detail that it took to get that i mean as matt was saying you know breathing is such a core part of storytelling. And a lot of times you see that left out when, when they're doing ADR scenes and, you, and somebody's really exerting and you just get a little puff or something. And you, you, sometimes you're really, you know, come on, man, give it to me. Because <laughs> cause it's, it sells the story, right? Because at the end of the day, that's, all, that's our jobs. We gotta sell the story with sound. And um, so anyway. Uh, we did have another episode three clip, so why don't we go to that, Jason? Let's take a look at that one. today. May you always walk in the light, sir. Have you ever tried this? a brutality to the dish because the flavor doesn't come only from the bird its bones and beak and feet cut the inside of your mouth not so much that it hurts just enough that you bleed don't be afraid girl and I said I should know above all others that sometimes brutality is the only path to mercy.
That's a guy you love to hate, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's excellent. Yeah, he's excellent. He's a good bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want to say about that scene? Uh, uh, it's another. It's a good example of the world that the guys have created. Yeah. I imagine another one with space amongst dialogue. You get a real sense. Uh, again, it's a one that's been designed by Rafe and his director to have give us some space. We come out of the big opening titles. And then it's really quiet at the opening. Mm. You're hearing the creatures in the forest. Mm. Mm. You're hearing the sort of this camp that you've never seen. Like, you're given time, sound is given time to lead the audience, mm. which doesn't happen in every TV show. Like, sound, you sound draws you in, and then the story starts, mm. basically. Yeah, and we, 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 were, we were allowed to kind of play the environment. We, well, we, we pushed to play the environments up around unnaturally for television really we kind of wanted these these things to really sit around the environments that every time we traveled through to different places you felt the space that you were in so you know we always overdid it with lots of you know creatures off screen um, that we knew were there from the books and, and and just pushing and twisting there's always you know if you're in a camp even though you're not seeing the soldiers we made sure that the crowd would you know there's a lot of crowd recorded for this because it had to be specific because you can't just go to you know sound effect 101 barbara or you know what i mean it was just kind of like it all had to be done so we just wanted to keep it alive a lot until those moments like we spoke about before when you do come out of the sound you're like oh right okay something's going to happen here yeah. Um, and and in that one, yeah, it's, it's a good fun scene. There's lot, there's some really again nice bits of foley. Yeah, he's eating and that, all that would be. Stuff. Yeah, I think this is a standout for Barney again. Like yeah. even from the off, you've got this young lad who's taking this train. It's rattling, and you just yeah. know that something. He's not going to go and see a nice person. And yeah. That's such a subtle thing, but it made such a big difference. And when he's eating the bird and the crunching and the blood, like yeah, we do a bit in there, but yeah. like, he's turned up as well to the party and he, he anchors everything and gives it that reality. So, yeah, props to props to him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the foley in the show is is really spectacular. Um, let's let's take a look at the uh, episode five scene. This is uh, the introduction of Loyal. Cycle. Oh, I didn't even hear you come in. <gasps> Stay back! <laughs> oh dear, you humans are very excitable. My first day in Tarvalon, I could not believe the uproar. Children cried, women screamed, and a mob chased me all the way across the city waving knives. I'm afraid I was almost beginning to get a little upset. I tell you, it was not for this I left the steading. Steading? You're an ogre. Ogier. Loyal, son of Arendt, son of Halan. And who are you? Rand. Rand Althor. Your name sings in my ears. Rand Althor. <laughs> it is quite exciting to meet an Aeolian. I've read much of your people. I'm not an Ioman. Really? Red hair is one of the few physical traits that can help you work out where a human is from. I'm from the two rivers. An Ioman from the two rivers? I'm not an Ioman. An Ioman from the two rivers who insists that he is not an Ioman. That is very odd. I like oddities. You know this book? Yes. Why would the travels of Jane Fastrider make you sad? It's a first-class adventure. No, I... A girl I know used to read this book every day. Thought she was Jane herself reincarnated. <laughs> well, that would be quite unlikely. With all the humans, all... It's just something she thought, you know. I see. I forget how frivolous you humans can be with your thoughts. Where is she now, this... Girl, or is she a woman? You age so quickly. I'm not sure. I came to Tarvalon because she was heading to the White Tower, but... What's going on? The Aes Sedai are returning from battle with the false dragon, parading him through the streets to show the people the dangers of madness and hunger for power. How far a man can... Sorry, I... I've got to go. 
to the procession. I'll come with you. Just give me a moment to gather my things. I'll see you out there. <laughs> Always in such a rush, these humans. Never taking time to properly prepare for what they're walking into. <laughs> you know, th it's such a great cast. <laughs> you know, uh, just across the board, the performances are just really, really terrific. Did you do something to his voice to make it... Yeah, this is yeah. where Matt really earned his money. This is his bit. <laughs> well, I mean, the... <laughs> uh, the cast is amazing, and uh, and he's particularly really good, I think. Yes, yes. And, yes. Um, but I think the suit that he's wearing is quite difficult. Just like so, we did actually redo that. We done. Uh, we redid all of his lines actually in a studio, and it took for the whole series or just for, for that the whole scene. Whole series for the whole series. Oh wow. Wow. I mean, it, it took him, he's so good, it didn't take him very long. But uh, but doing it in ADR gave him that flexibility to put that element of fun in there that I think is really important and was really important to the character. Um, yeah. Like, it wasn't, didn't need directing. It was just, I think, the, the prosthetics are so hard to get that across, I would imagine. Mm. Um, so, yeah, he's amazing and he redid it. We recorded at a high frequency, sampling frequency. We were at 96, I think, on this. And then... We did use a bit of pitching just to sort of alter it slightly, but a lot of it is in the performance, really. Um, we really tried to sell the weight because we have to hear his voice a lot, so that you don't want to go too far because I think it can sound unnatural. So mm -hmm. it gets demon to... sounding if you go too deep sometimes, you know. Yeah. yeah. So trying to sell the weight in other ways. So when he, his footsteps are obviously massive, when he takes a step, the room rattles. You hear the shake of the lights and all that yeah. sort of stuff. Like trying to use those sort of signatures to sell the sell his size and weight mm -hmm. and presence a little bit more than just pitching his voice down to a sort of monster level, because he conveys a lot of important information as well, yeah. which is really you want the audience to listen. Like, and we didn't want the audience to tune out. Yeah. Um, and the backgrounds are really fantastic in that scene. I mean, again, I think, you know, I know when I talk to people about sound, they say, oh, you add the music? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because yeah. the, there's no sense, you know, they just, you stick a microphone in and there you go. There's, well, there's all those people milling around outside with clanking stuff and horse hooves and, you know. Uh, so talk about that. Just do, Did you just sort of build all those layers of backgrounds and then just leave it to the mix stage to, you know, decide what you were going to bring in and out? Or It was another one of, I'd, I'd say that it's another one of Rafe's key things that he wanted to get right really early on. So Tarvalon. we spent a lot of time getting Tarvalon to sound as exotic as it does because it's this, it's the cultural hub of this world and we need to sell that everyone everybody goes there and it's a melting pot of cultures and ideas and we had lots of references to to go from that he gave us and so we got feedback from that really early on and um we tried to do it with bells and interesting horns and crowd and street mm. yellers and stuff and didn't want to go too bell y because it would get like too religious and feel too Mm. of this earth so but you have to be really careful about what bell you use um but just lots of time and lots of layers basically yeah and just different accents different cultures so you, you're kind of like oh we found this interesting atmosphere recorded in tibet we can kind of put it in there because we're not worried that it's a street in dublin you know so that kind of thing so and it, they, it had to sound so different from the two rivers mm. because where that where our characters had come from they walk in and they're just like, what the hell is this place? You know, this is insane. We've never been anywhere here so before, so we had to kind of make the audience feel like that as well, you know. It's yeah. just like really, exo as Luke said, exotic, different. I mean, it was good fun to do. I, that's one of my favourite locations, really. Mm. Yeah, and to touch on what Luke said earlier, it's, the, again, if the picture works, half our story is told, and, you know, the first shot of Tarvalon, a camel walks across <laughs> yeah. the screen. And the, don like, and so the that, birds, yeah, the like, donkeys. So yeah. then we kind of know where we're going with that, really. Yeah. And like, obviously it's Amazon, it's big and lush and beautiful, so we're just, we're supporting that. But I yeah. think the important thing for us is keeping that alive when we're not in those initial shots in the streets. That, that world is still going on, mm. and I think that that... Yeah. is sold throughout in the sound. Obviously. We tried to change the geography as well, so it's not just because you're going around the city quite a bit. 
we didn't just kind of go copy paste so it's like we tried to change it so you're down a back alley so what would be down this back alley well you might have mm -hmm. a street seller or there's a barbershop or you're outside the back of the inn so there might be a little a pub or something going on so mm -hmm. and the time of days and we, we tried to think of a a, what, as a version of a call to prayer but of that world so it wasn't a call to prayer it would be we'd use it as, as bells and different things just to kind of just change people you know just make it interesting all the time you know mm. and it, that 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 was that was tough but also really fun and and you know it's just just to keep interest and yeah. you know well, the detail shows, and, and, you know, I mean, one of the things about backgrounds, of course, it's just such a subliminal thing for an audience. They don't know, you know, I mean, you, you go with crickets or birds, you know, you, you know, <laughs> they don't cut to a cricket, right? <laughs> but we know it's nighttime, right? They don't cut to a bird, but we know the sun's coming up or whatever. And uh, so just as, you know, filmically, audiences they just start to hear a background and it immediately paints the scene. Now, it's not taking anything away from the fantastic DP and set design and all the rest of it, but hey, come on, we're sound people and <laughs> you guys did a great job. Um, I also wanted to talk about for a second some of the loop group stuff because there is just endless background speaking. Um, you know, I don't, do you call it wall over there? We call it wall over here. Um, there's just a lot of sort of wall-to-wall -wall walla that just sort of weaves in and out. And again, as part of the backgrounds, sets the stage. I just want to talk about that for a second. Yeah, well, we all, uh, we all have a go at the background crowd. Mm. Luke and Ben definitely helped out on that sort of stuff. So mm. we track lay as much. And uh, myself and from a dialogue department as well, we track lay from stuff that we can use. Obviously, you can't use stuff that Luke Group that you've shot specifically for shows. That's not stuff you can reuse across shows. Mm. But I've done a lot of my own recordings as well as a Ben and Luke. So we track lay as much as we can from that to build a bed because, and then we use the loop Group or the Walla on to, uh, which we record specifically for Wheel of Time to add that extra layer of gloss and proximity. The, the useful thing for the crowd is, you know, when you're in those streets, if you hear a really close voice, you can make it feel quite claustrophobic and you can sort of get a real sense of people being surrounded by people. So that's what the sort of specific Wheel of Time loop group was really useful for. Mm -hmm. um, and again, the Bible the that Bible, Sarah yeah. created for that is really useful. We we had specific lines and specific foods and specific trades for Tarvalon that we could use, uh, stuff specific to the White Tower as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we had... I had a lot of help with the loop group because it was huge. We had sort of another couple of crowd editors um, handling all of that. Uh, yeah, it was massive. Mm. But um, but then that is always living within this world of effects crowd and sort of library, not our own li personal library crowd that we've sort of built up because to sell that weight of the hundreds of people in the street Scale. is not that easy with a loop group of yeah. sort of 10, 12 people. Especially during COVID. Yeah, I yeah. Say, so, yeah. recording loop group through COVID. Is... Yeah, the entire thing was shot during COVID. So the vast majority of the loop group was co uh, shot using um, Clean Feed, I think it is. The software, so most of the actors were at home. Uh, most of the actors were at home. I think we allowed, I think we got to the point where we had two actors on the stage, but everyone else was in their own sort of home studios. The uh, loop group Walla actors have been amazing here at coming up with ways and setting up their own systems. Mm so they can record at home and that gives you great flexibility weirdly as a crowd editor because you get 12 mics as opposed to getting two from mm. a studio mm -hmm. right but obviously it's quite time intensive yeah. uh building up conversations and having multiple conversations where multiple people speak to each other is quite difficult so you're you're having to come up with ways of constructing the crowd in a slightly different way mm. um i really don't enjoy it i hope that we can get back to doing it properly <laughs> very very soon get back to being with one another again yeah, 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 yeah definitely. totally. Well, I get to be with you guys. You're in London. I'm in Santa Monica, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah. We could have come to Santa Monica, though. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, it's very, it's going to be a very nice day. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's really I'm 15 nice blocks from the beach, so maybe I'll take a walk and go to see the Pacific Ocean. Um, so let's, let's go to the Blood Snow uh, fight, uh, which is really just a spectacular piece of foley. I mean, I just can't even. Uh, so let's take a look at that, Jason.
Wow. <laughs> I would not want to piss that lady off. Um, <laughs> she is badass. The performance again. The now I, I again I'm assuming most of that's ADR. It's just. Uh, absolutely no. In this case, no. That is about I'd say about ninety eight percent production. I think. Really? Wow. We had a we had a full we did have a full pass in ADR just to see, but uh -huh. the original was just so genuinely brilliant that like yeah. it just wasn't. I mean the squeals and the the not just the breathing. It's just all the vocalizations of the exertions and everything. It's just spectacular. Yeah, we and then the, the odd hole, but other than that, nothing. Yeah. yeah sure. The uh, and the foley is just really really great all the sword work and the, the footsteps and and then the design that you guys put on top of that you know like with the slow motion when she grabs the cape and so why don't you talk about some of the i'm sure it just took a half a day to knock out but yeah, it's, it's <laughs> funny, enough. funny enough no, yeah, it was, ben's uh... known for his speed and that was that was all him <laughs> it's uh i mean what was what's great about that is like you know as it's it's there's there's no music on it it's it's a pretty brutal fight um it's in the snow it's a woman versus loads of guys and it's just gory and it's and she's pregnant it's just kind of like you know it's got to sound good otherwise we're definitely letting that scene down really so but it was just um yeah, he's chore choreographed amazingly. Um, when it first came in, it was just uh, our main actress and then all the other soldiers, um, and it was like a reenactment. And then when they shot it, for, so we tracked later to that, and then when they shot it again, it was almost shot perfect. It was amazing. So we'd done a track layer version to this kind of temp up, and then it came in, and it was like, wow, you know, it, it just works. So, but we, we always had the thing, you know, star of trying to avoid too many whooshes and giving swords and spears and that their own little character really and we we tried to do that quite a bit throughout the series but within that that as well because things are con, con you know swinging around and just trying to amp up the hits so you know the swords are as violent as as the sticks and just keeping it speed and rhythm and it was fine for me to do a pass of just all the swords and the whooshes and the kind of impacts and the cause but then it was just like okay now with the dialogues are in there what we need to do is ground them we need to hear that they're in the snow and who spoke to barney and just said look just concentrate on just really tight moves and, and the feet the snow just kind of give us short sort of stuff so it can just feel quick really and keep it moving so it was it was a really fun one to do um and, and, it, and it, it was great and i think yeah it, it, it was yeah really it. good like um collaboration there yeah. like ben working with the foley department is yeah. not a scene with a sequence like that is so busy and so hectic and it could sound like just a mess yeah. of like footsteps and shuffles and so yeah. so ben has that first pass at it building it up doing what he can getting the real weight and the dynamics and the difference and then yeah. ben and then we can hand it over to barney and we can talk him through it, and then he can patch the gaps with the foley that we can't do. And sound yeah, do so, you know, it was good. Yeah, it was great. And it was yeah, the guy, you know, the, the guys as well, the crowd. We could giving them lots of armor just so they feel a bit kind of different. She's very tight. Her foley's quite tight, and they're a bit more, you know, loose. They're a bit more kind of lolloping around and stuff. But it, but it's just great, you know. And it, and again, mixing it in in Atmos gave us that ability. When you, if you ever heard it, you know, when the spears go past you they're coming right through the room and that kind of thing when she when she's throwing the you know spears and knives and that they're all it's all moving around so it's a really good fun scene to do and a, and a re another great opening we were really lucky that we had great that was the cold opens to to all these episodes so they were always the one we were always like right what's this one going to be so it's great and, and well designed and obviously that that choice to give us the space and not have the music yeah right, mm. is yeah. Know, yeah isn't isn't a uh, I mean, it works, yeah, but, yeah. you know, you can imagine another version where it's music from, like, yeah. frame two. Oh, totally. They drop all the foley out, drop all that out, yeah. and it's yeah. just, you know, some majestic, you know, kind they of punctuating... Yeah, they tried it. They did ask, didn't they? And we thought, I think we, we actually, we got to seven, so we thought, oh, we could actually maybe kick back a bit on this. And we were like, no, actually, let's give it a go. It'll work. Let us have our moment. And it came in, and, uh, yeah, luckily we got away. Well, I don't think there was a lot of music going in, but it might have started a bit earlier. It was. There was a, at one point an earlier yeah. point. But, again, everyone, like, gave us the space. And yeah. then, then when the, then the music comes in, and it's got double the impact, doesn't it? Yeah, because exactly. you right. saved it for that moment. Exactly, yeah. And her performance is just so spectacular. I mean, it's just 
it just proves how much stronger women are than men. Yeah. <laughs> just, you know, she grabs that cape, you know, and you're like, oh, my God, she's going to pull this thing out of her body. <laughs> you know, uh, I think I got to go to the bathroom, you know. Yeah, exactly. uh, but yeah, um, yeah. all right, let's look at this last scene. Um, and this is uh, also from episode seven. how they reached the two rivers undetected. And what happened to the guiding? Did it just get a lot colder in here? Oh, dear. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to channel. What is Machin Shin? It translates from the old tongue to mean the Black Wind. And what exactly is the Black Wind? Machin Shin will speak to you. Do not listen. We'll never make it to our way gate. How far are we from the gate of Fordara? It's closer, but I don't... Take us there. Go! Quickly! <laughs> That was uh, that was a tour de force on on all of it. There's the the voices, the sound design, the backgrounds, the foley, the um, and, and again, I gotta I gotta hand it to Rafe. Uh, I mean, the way he built everything, and of course, you know, the picture editors uh, are pacing it, but I imagine he's in that room with them as much as he's in the room with you. So he is leading the way, but um, you know. Once they they come out through the portal there, um, and all we hear is just the wind and the breathing, you know, and it's just like they keep he keeps giving the audience a break because that is so intense. And then we're sitting there panting, like, <laughs> okay, man, I think I need a drink. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so talk about that scene a little bit. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's it is all of us. That's a it's a beautiful scene to showcase all of the all of us coming together. I think um, 
we, again, try to stick to the book a lot. And the book talks about, uh, well, Matt will talk about the, the voices, but the, that it would talk to you in your own voice. So, so we had to match that. But also it was this described as this big flock of birds and it came in and it was different one time and it was it was and we made it like glassy and then it changed again and we thought oh maybe it should be a bit more particly and rocky and then mm. eventually we were like it's kind of missing a voice it mm. needs a it needs to be demonic and weird and i think i would just like it needs to be like Rah! Mm. and you were like oh that sounds like death metal screams and we were like oh death metal screams that yeah. could be good yeah so i had a little look on the internet for vst instruments that are death metal screams and sure enough there is one <laughs> yeah. of course i think it's sound yeah. line or something <laughs> yeah. we took all these screams and like uh, I, I printed them all and we twisted them and layered them and yeah. and dopplered them and just created this sort of massing mass swirl of like screams basically A anger and anger yeah exactly and that sat with the physical glassy brittly stuff and it all just sort of moves and dopplers together to give you this sort of the anger and the and the shape um so that's matching shins sound design bit mm. um which was me but voices wise mm. yeah i mean the matching shin it, it's such a those sequences it's such a great sequence of sound because sound again is telling the story like mm. if you didn't have the voice it would what's going on there but at the same time it's a really exciting sequence that you're trying to get story through in the voices. So it was really difficult to get the right balance there. And I think you just about hear what they're saying, and that's the idea. Um, but then we wanted to get the sense that this voice was everyone. It wasn't, As much as it was supposed to be the cast's voice, we wanted to get a balance. So everyone's layered up there. And, and as the lines happen, we're sort of trying to weave between different voices. So it might start off with... A, uh, a female voice, and then it might, uh, which will morph into mm. Perrin's voice, and 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 likewise for all the different characters. But then it's so nice that there's vocal elements within the sound design. It's definitely required all three of us to do mm. that scene, and and the other yeah, team yeah. of eight people supporting us as well. Like, but yeah. we'd go in, Luke. Like Matt would be laying up the dialogues, and Luke was working on mashing shin, and I was doing like you know probably a, a bit of wind. But it was kind of like we'd go <laughs> in, and we'd, we'd kind of like go into each other's room and stuff. And Matt was like joining, the, trying to get between the different vocals and that. And then we were listening. And then you put it all in, and we're like, Christ, we're just losing the clarity. What do we need to hear? Do we need to hear? So again, there was a lot of that process mm. going on, really. Really, and it was like, I think, as I said, I think you you do understand just about what they're all saying. But it's it's like you want it all, but you can't. You know, we're just like, yeah, but I really like all the what the dialogues are doing, and I really love what the sounds are. Mm. And so we kind of just chat and talk about it, and then I, I think, you know, and then and then throw it to Doug, it delay yeah, Lee, yeah. and say, can you just mix that? <laughs> well, that's the fun thing, yeah. isn't it? Like yeah, yeah. it's such a such a team effort, like. Yeah. Like Chris in the edit with Rafe spends so much time working on yeah. trying to building his edit, and then it comes to us, and then we spend so much time, and that's the beauty of Sona here that we've got our three interconnecting rooms, so we just we do move around yeah. a lot between uh, and listen to what each other's doing, yeah, which is no, which is common in the film world in the UK, but not so common in the TV world. Everyone's working so disparately, even prior to COVID, working mm -hmm. from home, so there's not that. Collaboration in the TV world in the UK is, is a bit more difficult because they're not paying, productions aren't paying for sort of mm. rooms. Whereas we're set yeah. up here and we're all working together and we can listen to each other's work. She's great. Yeah. Yeah. And then we sort of try and weave it and then it goes to Doug and Doug works his magic and Doug worked for a long time on this sequence. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's really good. And again, it's one of those sequences where sound is pushing the story forward and that's, that's yeah. why we're doing it. And, like. and visually, we've got the, we're allowed to tell those stories. Like, thank God that. Nynaeve just pulls this giant mm. ball out yeah. of nowhere because yeah. it means that we can create this safe bubble yeah. that's all powerful on the outside and it's screaming and the voices mm -hmm. are trying to get in and we cut inside and it's just energy and it's pure and it's her signature sound from an earlier episode where she mm -hmm. finds out that she can channel and do this, this one power wonderful stuff. And so that allowed us to create an almost a, a break in the design, in the sound to fit in the way gate being opened and to fit in these voices and so much handing over to tell these little stories at key points to sort of help push the story forward but but you're right there's so much information and when you get outside you just like <gasps> you can finally take a breath and um yeah, yeah. yeah i think it, it turned out pretty good <clears throat> yeah it turned out okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> for a multi-billion dollar production well you know listening to it in surround i heard a lot of the way the space was used and then listening to it in stereo, 
uh, was a different sort of sense. That's why I really wanted to hear those overheads because I'm sure the amount of detail that I heard in that mix, that I'm sure that that completely immersive thing that you guys experienced when you were at the mix stage uh, was was probably a real uh, pleasure. So anyway, congratulations, guys. I mean, it's a Thank stellar you. amount of work. Before we wrap, I just wanted to talk for a second about Sona. So talk about that. So you guys have all worked together individually and then put this sound collective together. Is that how that happened? Yeah, I, th I think um, these boys are slightly older than me um, <laughs> and they've known each other for a very long time. They started off together, didn't you, back in... Yeah, we were, myself and uh, Matt were runners together about just about 20 years ago. We started a company and we were made tea and uh, we came through and we've kind of get, you know, gone freelance uh, and, and stayed friends and worked with Luke. And then we just, when, when, when this came about, this project, it was a really good opportunity for us all to kind of come together. Um, and, and then we just and formed this kind of relationship and just kind of thought, and with COVID, we were like, how do we get ourselves out there? We need something to form, and, and yeah. that's where that evolved. I think it? that was the, there was a bit of a fear from my point of view yeah. when COVID happened that we didn't know what this was going to mean for the film industry. Like, uh, set, sets were closing down, things were shutting, and we didn't know how long it was going to be. And I was on a show, and it was just it just ended that week, mm. and and you sat at home thinking, well, when am I going back to work? And not only do you need to think about making money, but you also need to keep yourself busy as well. And I'm not one for sitting and doing nothing. So we sort of got our heads together, and we were like, look, uh, collectively our CVs are pretty unbelievable. Individually, we're pretty good, but collectively, we're you know we're really good. So why don't we just team up yeah. and build something that's one unified umbrella of collective sound goodness and mm. and see what happens and um i think it's yeah it's been been a, a good venture for yeah, us yeah i mean wheel of time is great because we're all on it mm. and we can all do it together and collaborate but that doesn't mm. but we're here to support each other and do our own projects which is the really nice thing ben and yeah. luke are doing a job at the moment which i'm not involved in but i'm here to help and yeah. we all have different skills and we all have different backgrounds ben and luke have done such huge sort of studio films and I've done a lot, I've done some of those, but I focus more on the TV world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have different skills and I can't make sound design and they can, so <laughs> that helps <laughs> having them around. But he's good at telling, he's good at like leading us in a direction. So it kind of, we work, you know, and we work and, and, and we are mates as well. So and it's, it's sometimes hard to bring that together, a business and friends, but we, you know, we try and keep that. So it's, but, it, but yeah, yeah it, it, it's just worked and Wheel of Time has kind of helped us. It's been an amazing job to start off on because oh, yeah. it was mm. so demanding and because we really had to hit the bar. And I, and I think it's been good. It's been a good showpiece to show what we can do as a collective. But it's uh, it's all it's it, yeah, it's been fun and we yeah, we just uh, yeah, it, it's been great. You know, it's been really good. Well, break a leg with that, you guys. Um, Thank you. Thank you so if I ever much. get to London, I'll, I'll come by. You have a facility or are you, how are you working that part of it out? Yeah, we have basically three rooms. Uh, there's a bit of a, we're in Hackney, which is a bit of a like hipster's paradise, essentially. <laughs> um, and it's a dirty old warehouse that you wouldn't walk past and think anything of. But deep inside are some custom built rooms and we've got floating rooms and soundproof and acoustic treatment and we also share our floor with other people that work in the music industry so there's mm -hmm. uh, there's a producer over there and on that wall there's a mix engineer and there's another guy who mixes and engineers there as well so it's a wonderful hub to get your head out of just film you can go and talk to somebody about music for 10 minutes while you're making a coffee or doing whatever so it's a beautiful place for us it really works and i'm only two minutes around the corner so that's a win. <laughs> it's a real improvement. Like, uh, so many of the rooms that productions would hire, are, I'm sure it happens in LA and New York as well, that they're just offices. So you're just, as an editor, you're just listening to the person next door to you. Yeah. And they're yes. quite, some, yes. quite often quite small. Yeah. So yeah. now we've got these sort of flame rooms. I can see uh, Luke through my window, unfortunately, but <laughs> I can't, uh, importantly, I can't hear him. Yeah. So, uh, like, so we've been out, Luke's got a huge amount of gear. We've all got, like, so I'm in sort of 7 1 2, and everyone else is in 7 1. So that, that's not possible at home. And, and it, right. having that degree of security, to have all our equipment here and know yeah. that we don't have to move out every job and find a different room is is really nice. I yeah, think. it's been yeah. really it's been really good, and it just yeah, yeah it's allowed us that we keep going about that collaboration and creative thing. We've been been it, with, with COVID, we were able to just come in and kind of go have a listen to this, you know, work together on scenes and 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 kind of be able to 
you know work closely on those scenes whereas rather than just waiting to get feedback we could get, you know sent it over the internet and then they download we just walk into each other's room and just kind of have a you know a little audition and go from there so it's yeah. Um, yeah, it's great it's been really cool i think also having like really nice sounding rooms has meant that we can deliver closer to what our idea of of the the mix will be like mm. we can do a pre pre-mix mm. and trust it and it's mm. good mm -hmm. obviously we need someone like Doug to tailor and shape the stuff and get the music in but mm. we, we it can leave Sona so confident and so um, representing just what we want it to sound like so that's been a, yeah. a huge deal for me yeah. uh, is trusting the room and trusting what we're doing yeah because as I think Luke said before we have so many conversations with Rafe and Chris and all that sort of stuff um, if we can present as close to their idea as we as we can then Doug can focus on the uh, improving it creatively and working mm -hmm. on the creative aspect of mm -hmm. the mixing rather mm -hmm. than sort of all that sort of boring technical stuff hopefully we can take a lot of it out of his hands and he can really focus on the detail mm -hmm. yeah well it's nice that you guys started out small with this little project to kind of get the company <laughs> rolling um, well continued success to you guys thank you so much for talking with me today thank you. and uh, thank all you. the best Cheers, Woody. Cheers, man. Really nice you. to meet you, buddy. Cheers, Really man. appreciate Likewise. your time. Thank you. Thank Cheers. You very much. All the Bye -bye. best, man. See Take you care, man. Bye. Look after yourself. Stay safe. All right, that was a great panel. Uh, such amazing insight from everybody here. Um, I just want to thank the guys from Sona, Matt, Skelding, Luke, Gentry, and Ben Meek, and as well as Woody Woodhall for a really great night. I also want to thank our sponsors again, OWC, AJA, American Cinema Editors, and Filmmaker U. And finally, look for our next event where Bobby Osteen is going to go inside the cutting room with some of the editors of the hit HBO show Succession on March 24th. You can register for that event right now. And as always, thanks again for watching. Have a great night.